32 volleyball enthusiasts from around the world joined the first ever no combat volley duel championship, a 1v1 volleyball tournament in which attacking the enemy and entering their court was completely banned. And after an intense qualifier round, 16 players of different shapes and sizes advanced to the pre quarterfinals. As the sun rose, so did the tension, all 16 eyeing the final goal the championship trophy. The top 16 prepared themselves, knowing that this tournament would be unlike anything that they've ever faced before. Day 1 kicked off the tournament with the pre quarterfinals. And taking the stage first, the thoughtful and careful Saudi was up against a master's player. Perry was upbeat and friendly, but that didn't mean he would go easy on his opponent. Max's dash was the greatest strength here, but Perry knew that anything that dashes struggled with sharp corners, so he was careful to place the ball between the crossbars, restricting Saudi's dash as much as possible. At 2 5, Perry springs his plan into action, but Saudi managed to successfully save it with the dash and stay in the game. However, Perry knew that he had taken Saudi by surprise and could do it again. Realizing Perry's tactics, Saudi tried to turn it back on him, but Perry was always ready to answer Saudi's every shot. At 150, Perry does it again, playing it short and then hitting it long. And this time, he managed to make Saudi trip over his dash. Round 2 should have been a comeback for Saudi, but there was simply no time left. Mortis's heightened mobility played greatly to Perry's advantage, but since players could only use one brawler once, Perry had lost his strongest card early on. The second pre quarterfinal game between Proji and Ines saw them both on max. Proji, the esports fan, was up for any challenge, but he could usually read his opponents. Ines, though, was impossible to read, and all Proji could do was stay on guard at all times. As the seconds tick down, Proji notices Ines's tendency to stay at the middle of the map. He couldn't let this information go to waste, and at 238, played a very long shot. Ines expended every tool he had, but not even a gadget could help him save that one. Proji had just gained a 1 0 lead, but the look on Ines's white face was very unnerving. Did this man and have some secret plan of victory, he had to keep his guard up. But by the time the game entered the last minute, Proji was confident of his win. Ines had missed two long shots and almost missed a gadget from the nerves. Proji stopped holding back and went all out with another far shot. This time, Ines calmed his nerves and successfully gadgets it away. But Proji didn't slow down and played another long shot and this time, Ines had no answer to it. The energetic Hubble 2 faced off against BB God next. There was a very threatening aura around BB God that made him queasy. Predicting his opponent would go BB, as was their name, Hubble went BB as well. But he was shocked to see the game open with BB God playing Mortis. Mortis was the strongest brawler in this tournament, and Hubble knew that his brother would soon grow too slow to keep up with the ball. He had to get an early win to stay in the game. BB God tried to place the ball on the other side of the wall twice to try and throw Hubble off, but Hubble was always ready to hit it back. BB God tried again at 145, but it was still too slow and Hubble had no issues handling it. But by 140, Hubble was starting to feel himself slow down against the ball. Meanwhile, BB God wasn't even sweating. Even when the ball was played long, Mortis only needed one dash to get to it. BB God had no intention of going for a draw. And as the final 60 seconds began, he tried the wall trick once more. And this time, Hubble simply could not keep up with the speed of the ball. BB God had made it a battle of attrition and won. Perry, Proji and BB God had advanced to the quarterfinals. An impossible and zombie ghost received walkovers due to their opponents not showing up. There were three matches left till the end of day one. The fourth pre-quarter final game began. As one would expect from his appearance, Yannick the Griffmane played Griff against Rones' Sam. He just wanted to play Griff, even if it meant losing. Rones had been a nervous wreck, even in the pre-quarter finals, so he was happy to see that he had a tactical advantage. However, this game would be a shocking upset. Sam was demanding to play since his speed boost required constant super spamming. And this weakness became very clear when, at 129, Yannick played the ball to the same spot twice. Rones couldn't maintain a constant speed and ended up losing the point and despite his best efforts, he could not bring it back. In all honesty, this was Sam's game, but Rose's nerves had gotten the better of him, and by some wild luck, Yannick was moving on to the next round. I Love Teeming was an arrogant fellow, and his opponent for the pre quarterfinal game only made him laugh. Ajin Tovu, quite an emotionless, played Sam, with Teeming playing Max. Teeming saw the win in sight. He had the clear tactical advantage. Thus, he began trolling from the very start, being more worried about spinning than where he was sending the ball, causing it to land in the easiest spots for Ajin Tovu to react. But Teeming's trolling would come to a stop when at 2 8, Ajin Tovu played a sudden flurry, forcing two gadgets out of Teeming in quick succession. And for a moment, he was stunned at this sudden out by his unassuming opponent. Little did he know that Ajahn Tobu was also a master's ranked player, and even in a casual mode like Volley Brawl, far outskilled him. But Ajahn Tobu wasn't done. At 112, he placed a ball far beyond Teeming's reach, and all Teeming could do was watch as the point was pulled out from under him. And as the clock ticked down, Teeming simply gave up, leaving Ajahn Tobu with a victory of 2 to 0. As day one drew to a close, it was time for the last pre quarter final. Despite them both picking BB, the mischievous bread was wary of his opponent. For reprisal, 
Russell was an ex-pro Brawl Stars player, but did Rip Russell still have the same sharp skills he did before he'd quit? Brad was about to find out. The map was quite open and the mirror matchup meant that this would be a game of the mind rather than the mechanics. At 220, Brad made his move, attempting to knock Rip Russell off early, but the ex-pro answered the challenge with no issues. They both knew that BB would eventually run out of speed, and early point was their best bet to victory. However, the two opponents seemed neck and neck, Brad only surviving this long because Rip Russell wasn't as sharp as he used to be. But Brad wasn't willing to give in easy, and at 1-6 tries his trick again, and this time Reprisal was taken completely by surprise, and Brad almost couldn't believe that it had worked. With less than a minute left, Reprisal had nothing left to give, leaving the ecstatic Brad to be the last person to move on to the quarterfinals. Day 2 had begun, and it was time for the quarterfinals. Proji was up against BB God, and once again found himself against an opponent he couldn't read, this one a bit more menacing than the last. Proji predicted that BB God would go BB, but for the second time in the tournament, that didn't happen, and Proji found himself at a disadvantage against the Edgar pick. BB God had to drag the fight out, an early point would almost guarantee his defeat. Proji knew that the Edgar super was a massive asset, so he had to force it out as quickly as possible. At 1.36, he sees an opening and successfully makes BB God use his super. He needed to do this two more times to truly weaken his opponent. But BB God wasn't shaken and struck back at 1.17 with Proji managing to save it by mere centimeters. BB God kept his cool, he just had to last until the 30 second mark. That was when the ball speed would be too much for his opponent. Right as the clock hits one minute, BB God attempts another play, but this time Proji predicts it perfectly. Mm, not enough. He needed to pitch the ball as far away from his opponent as he could, but as the seconds wore down, Proji remained persistent. At 0.52, Proji forces out BB God's second super. He could see that the Edgar player was tiring, but there was one more super left and he had to get rid of it. 0.43, he saw BB God lose his final super. They were the only thing allowing him to keep up with BB's speed, and now they were depleted. But Proji's celebration was short-lived. He had grown so focused on draining BB God's supers that the ball was suddenly faster than him. BB God had lost all his supers but had survived until the 30-second mark. Now the game was his. Without wasting any time at 029, BB God made his play, and Proji was too slow to reach it. His tunnel vision had cost him the game, leaving BB God as the first semi-finalist for the tournament. After his surprising win against Rones, Yannick the Griffman was now up against Ajahn Tovu, the Masters player, the toughest opponent he would face in the entire tournament. If the BB God vs Proji match said anything, it was that Yannick's Edgar pick had the advantage. But Ajahn Tovu had won his previous game while being at a disadvantage, so Yannick knew he couldn't rest easy. Right as the game begins, Yannick is hit with a brutal realization. He had picked the shield gadget. This meant he couldn't freely use his supers and would have to rely on his brain power to the maximum and win by prediction to beat Ajentovu's speed advantage. As the game began, Yannick was faring quite well against Ajentovu, predicting the ball placement correctly. Like BB got before him, if he could last until the 30 second mark, he could win this. By the time the clock hit 138, Ajentovu realized that he was running out of time. Soon the ball would become too fast for him. He had to change his strategy. But Yannick was predicting too well, so Ajentovu knew he couldn't outsmart him. But even if you can predict where the ball will go, it's pointless if you can't get there in time. Ajentovu gave Yannick an impossible task. The first ball was short forcing Yannick super out. Without his gadget, he was now completely vulnerable. Yannick realized what was coming and began to make his way to the bottom of the court, but try as he may, he just didn't have enough speed to get there on time. Thanks to Yannick's mistake of gadget choice and Ajahn Tovu's change in strategy, the game had gone in favor of the Masters player, leaving Yannick at a loss of 0-1. His win against Reprisal had given Bread a massive confidence boost for his next game against Zombie Ghost. But if this tournament had taught him anything, it's that pick advantage meant nothing if they weren't smart enough. Both players came out swinging, their every placement was different from the last. Zombie Ghost had recognized his pick disadvantage and played very wide shots, intent on making Bread waste his supers. But Bread wasn't about to lose either, making Zombie Ghost move around the map a lot, almost outplaying him at 127. And as the minutes dragged on, the threat of getting outsped by the ball grew dangerously close to Zombie Ghost. Unlike Zombie Ghost, Bread was feeling no pressure and once again attempted to make Zombie Ghost drop the ball at 046. But it was a miscalculation since Zombie Ghost still had enough speed to keep up. But Zombie Ghost was starting to feel himself slow down and Brad was really keeping him on his toes. Brad took his shot again at 030. This time he was successful, ending with Brad advancing to the semi finals with a score of 1 0. It was time for the final quarterfinal of the day, and this time Impossible was up against Perry. This was Impossible's first top 16 game. Now, Impossible was a brave and gritty guy, but he couldn't help but feel intimidated by his opponent. Perry played BB and Impossible played Mortis. Statistically speaking, Impossible should win this, but against his far more experienced opponent, he chose not to let his guard down. The first thing Impossible noticed was that Perry kept placing the ball around the portal and maneuvering around it and the wall as Mortis was difficult. Was Perry doing this intentionally? It made 
sense, in a battle of attrition, Mortis would easily win, and Perry would be intent on restricting that as much as possible. Anytime Impossible did attempt a breakout, Perry would push the ball right back in. It was almost impossible for Impossible to find an opening to counterattack. Perry had him pinned. But in spite of that, Impossible finally caused a successful breakout at 38. He now had the advantage of mobility. Impossible had managed to break out of the corner, and the ball was traveling very fast now. Perry could see the window of opportunity closing. He needed to bring the fight back to the corner. With this ball speed, Mortis would not be able to play around the walls. Impossible was shocked at Perry's persistence. By the time the final 15 seconds began, Perry finally managed to get the ball back to the corner, but Impossible recovered it, almost completely messing up in the last 5 seconds. The first draw of the tournament, and the tiebreaker was going to be a surge volley duel. There was a lot more movement this time, and Impossible now knew he had to be careful against his opponent. By the time the clock hit 110, both players had burned through two of their gadgets. Both of them were trying to see who could outsmart the other. At 049, Perry lost his final gadget, but he held off long enough until Impossible lost his final gadget at 039. The whole game, Perry had been playing long balls, but at 029, he rapidly switched his tactic with a short ball. And by the split second, Impossible took to realize it, it was too late. It was a moment of disbelief for Impossible. Despite being at a disadvantage every time, Perry and Ajintovu before him had outwitted their opponents and come out victorious. Even in a game where the mechanics were as simple as passing a ball, Masters players were on a whole different level. After two grueling matches, Perry was the fourth semi-finalist. The final day of the No Combat Volley Duel Championship was here, and for the four players that had made it here, it was going to be a marathon all the way to the end. The first semi-final game was between Ajintovu and Bread. This was arguably the most balanced match of the tournament, and the winner would be whoever was best at wasting the opponent's gadgets and supers. Red had some confidence built up after beating Reprisal, but did winning against an ex-pro prove anything about his chances against someone who still plays the game? This match was going to answer that question. The beginning of the game saw Ajentovu forcing Bread all the way to the back of the map, but Bread used this to his advantage and played a short ball, forcing Ajentovu to use his super. At 228, Bread had taken the advantage. As the seconds wound down, a corner fight began again, but Ajentovu did this intentionally, following it up by throwing a ball far from Brett's position. Brett had to pop his gadget in order to save the ball, equalizing the advantage difference between them. Ajintobu, fully intent on forcing Brett to use his super, once again attempts a long shot, but to no effect. Ajintobu hits the same place thrice, no, four, no, five, six, no, eight times. Brett manages to save all eight, but he knew something was coming, and it happened after the ninth ball. Ajintobu pitched it short, and Brett, unprepared, fell for it. It was a moment of complete shock. As Intobu had done that while barely moving, Bread also felt regret. All he had to do was use his super or deflect the ball to a different direction. But as Intobu's repetitive actions had dulled those instincts from his mind, the Masters player was the first to secure a spot in the Grand Finals. And all eyes now turned to Perry vs BB God. After three rounds of holding back, BB God finally played BB, recognizing his formidable opponent. Perry picked Sam. Impossible had proven to be a challenge to Perry in the last game. Could BB God actually beat him? Or was BB God completely out of his league? The second semi-final kicked off. The portal game began once again. BB had a slight edge over Sam in that she had a consistent speed boost. And BB God knew that he would have to exploit this in order to win. At 156, the two players took on the whole map, trying to break the stalemate of the corners. But soon, they were back at it again. BB God realized that if he kept pushing the ball to the portal, Perry would have a tough time using Sam super comfortably. And suddenly, Perry found himself on the receiving end of his own strategy. At 056, the game shifted again to the open field, both players attempting to catch the other off guard. But Perry had recognized that he was up against a stronger opponent than in the previous round and was sweating a lot more. The clock wound down with neither player giving in, and by the time it hit the final 20 seconds, a new corner fight had begun on the right side. Despite being outspread by the ball, both BB God and Perry were instantly reading their opponent and countering every attempt they made. And as in the last round, Perry found himself facing another tiebreaker game. In a no combat volley duel between Sir the winner would be the person who first exhausts the opponent's gadgets. The previous match had taught BB God that he could keep up with Perry's placement tactics. He just needed to make sure to force the gadgets out of his opponent. But at 142, BB God was the first to lose a gadget, losing his second one only 14 seconds later with Perry still maintaining all three. Perry had the upper hand, and if BB God didn't do something quickly, he was going to lose. And suddenly, Perry saw his opportunity. Jumping on it quickly, he played a long shot, and BB God was left unable to do anything. Within an instant, Perry had spotted an open and shifted the game in his favor. Perry had succeeded once again and as though by fate, the two Masters players were set to face each other in the Grand Finals. The upbeat and friendly Perry against the silent but efficient Ajintovu. 
Only 30 minutes later, the grand finals began. Perry on Max, at Tofu on Mortis. It was like the first pre quarter final game all over again, except this time, Perry's opponent had the advantage. At Tofu had made an easy rise to the top while Perry had been hit by obstacles at every round. And now, it was time to decide who between them was truly worthy of the title of champion. The game began. Right off the bat, Perry immediately initiated a corner fight. As Entovu was in no rush to win, his tactic thus far had been to wait for an opening and take it. He knew Perry was planning something, and so he waited for the surprise attack. And at 2.17, it happened. Perry played a ball short, forcing Ajentovu to spend two dashes to get it. The mind games had begun, and Perry noticed that he'd forced Ajentovu to move to an awkward position. Ajentovu returns with a short play, but Perry throws the ball back as far as he can. Ajentovu is forced to use a full clip of ammo just to save it. The ball was moving much faster now. At two minutes in, Ajentovu attempts to sabotage Perry by placing the ball onto the jump pad, but Perry remembered BB God triggering the portal before engaging and used a similar trick here. Ajentovu did it again, but his accuracy was off this time around. Perry used his initial surprise attack a second time, forcing another full clip out of Ajentovu. Ajentovu could feel the pressure mounting from this new opponent. Against logic itself, Perry was using Mortis's strongest ability, the dashes, against him. Ajentovu needed to find an opening like he had in his previous games, but Perry was restricting his movement way too much. The same play was made again at 123. Ajentovu had grown used to the pattern by now, he wouldn't fall for it a third time. But Perry wasn't finished. This was the key to victory. Anything that Dashes struggled with sharp corners, he was going to put the ball somewhere a mortis would struggle to reach it. And at 1.30, he attempted again for a fourth time. Ajintovu was too slow to react. But had Perry won, there was more than a minute left on the clock. Ajintovu had a chance of bringing it back and pushing it to a tiebreaker, and Perry couldn't rest. At 042, Ajintovu tries his jump at trick one more time, but it was a futile attempt. He needed something more. Unlike his previous opponents, Perry was too good at reading placement, and Ajintovu simply couldn't find an opening to exploit. At 9 seconds, he tried the jump at trick one more time, but it was no use. The clock hit zero, and all eyes fell on the champion, Perry, who had defied all the odds and taken the win at the first ever no combat volley duel. Championship.